Welcome back to the Wheel of Time read-along. It's been a bit of a hiatus because one, the show was coming out, and two, I was inundated with people saying, Slow down! I need more time to catch up. Well, you've been given your time. I hope you've caught up, and now we are going to go ahead and continue with a read-along of the Lord of Chaos. Book six in the Wheel of of time. Before we get in the actual narrative, my first impression of this book was it actually kind of felt like a big change for the Wheel of Time in this read-through for me, because every book up until this point has kind of felt like another step up in escalation, whereas here it felt like every character was on the path they needed to start on, and we're just seeing them go deeper, deeper into, into their, their destiny. destiny. I hope that makes sense, but it was really a big feeling I had with this one. This is often cited as one of the best books in the Wheel of Time. It certainly has taken the number one spot for me at various points in my life. I've kind of settled at Knife of Dreams or Memory of Light for being my number one Wheel of Time book, but this still absolutely Lord of Chaos is solidly in my top five. But I'm gonna go ahead and ask the audience before we go ahead and get into like the narrative talk through, where did Lord of Chaos fall for you so far if this is your first read? And if it's your reread, where is it sitting with you now that you've freshly gone through it? Okay, but this book kicks off with the first important event being a meeting with Demon Dread, where he is going over the death of Ravin and the fact that Mulgideon and Lanfear have disappeared. And then he meets with three other Forsaken and delivers the message that the Lord of Chaos must rule. Because if there's one thing Robert Jordan knows how to do, it's have that initiating little tantalizing tidbit to make you want to keep going through this gargantuan series. And that's one of my favorite things you really do see from beginning to end a Wheel of Time. Just these little hooks that, yes, the series is so long, but he is going to pull you through it with all these temptations that are so tantalizing. Ah! We also catch up with Gawain and his adventuring with the Tower Aes Sedai. He hears of his mother's death, rumored to be at Randall Thor's hand, and more initiating incidents. And then finally, a plot line I believe that will be dropped for the show, we see more gays actually being offered by the Children of the Light some troops to help her regain her throne, something that she knows isn't actually a fair offer, but she has to take it. And there's scheming within the White Cloaks. But the real story, the main narrative really kicks off with Elaine and Nynaeve, where we are seeing some further teachings to Aes Sedai of Tel Iran Riyadh. There's some scenes that are horrific and kind of satisfying. It's always satisfying to see snobby Aes Sedai kind of get like put down a few notches. <sighs> Girl, I don't care that nightmares can become reality here, all right? I'll be fine. Why am I in a trolley cookbook? And Nynaeve is now working to heal Stilling and not finding too much success. And we also, of course, because of the end of the last book, have Mulgideon at Nynaeve's hand where she is wearing one of the uh, Angriel, Sangriel, I can never keep those straight, that Elaine made. And this is one of the few things where it's like, I get why in the story they are not telling everyone like, hey, we got one of the Forsaken. But as a logical adult now, this was a rather dumb choice. <laughs> I get this institution is deeply flawed and they are thinking they can handle this on their own. But in hindsight, perhaps it would have been better to tell everyone what is going on and get higher security around one of the literal forsaken you have within your grasps, whose knowledge goes far beyond what you know. It's just a little bit of a, you wanna think it through there. We of course also have the emissary from the Rebel Eyes die being sent to Rand and Min is going to be a part of it while Elaine cannot. And we have a meeting between the two where they're like, hey, Polyamory? <laughs> There's also the discovery through need within Teleron Riyadh of the Bowl of the Winds. And this is actually one of my favorite magical artifacts within the Wheel of Time. That's utilization and end game didn't quite live up to what I had expected first reading through the books, but it's still just one of those things that just adds so much mystery and uh, like things you can speculate about for this world. It's so cool that there's an Angriol that was created that can control 
climate. You wonder about what this world used to be like before the breaking that such powerful artifacts existed. It's just neat and I like it a lot. And of course, as the plot line between Elaine and Nynaeve progresses, eventually Nynaeve does actually end up healing Stilling with Loghain. And there's one of the most tense scenes in the series where, you know, in your first read through, you don't really know Loghain that well. And so having Nynaeve sit across from him, realizing that a false dragon has been healed and can channel again. And Nynaeve is just like, help, 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 please, help, please. That would be nice if we could, please, please. Please, please. Of course, she is then brought before Swan and heals her as well, as well as Swan second. And it's it's a great moment. It's such a really beautiful moment once you really get to fall in love with these characters. And it's one of the scenes I think is the most powerful in a reread because Swan towards the end of the series or by the end, you really love her. And so seeing her be allowed to touch Sayadar again and how much it means to her, knowing she no longer will have to grovel before these people that she is now on equal footing with, at least in, you know, much more of a significant sense than she once was. It's beautiful. Same thing for Leandrin. And of course, Nynaeve just continues to be probably the most important female channeler from this age. I get that there are a lot of other female channelers who have major influence and importance on this age, but Nynaeve, I won't get into spoilers, but she is someone who in the long run, assuming her discoveries and her way of approaching the one power live on beyond her, uh, she is going to have changed the world forever. Now let's go ahead and, and jump over to what I think a lot of people are going to, want to talk about, and that's Rand. Rand's storyline here is probably the darkest we've seen him up until this point. I could see a debate for book three, but we come to see Rand practicing the sword, and obviously Robert Jordan is demonstrating how powerful he has become, even in the physical sense. He's fighting five swordsmen and wins, and he actually has a knife thrown at him. He stops it with the one power, and he's like, Davin Bashir, why did you just throw a knife at me, dude? That's not, don't. But Davern Bashir is trying to tell Rand, like, you don't even need to be practicing with the sword. That's foolish. But we, the reader, know uh, channelers do not always have access to the one power, and it could be useful to actually have some non powered abilities ready to pull out. <laughs> I have you sealed in your mind. <laughs> God. So Rand is kind of, in my opinion, seeing how effective that was and just continuing to embrace that philosophy where yes, he is the most powerful channeler who's walking the world right now, but that doesn't mean he needs to entirely rely on it. It's an intelligent move. And we also know that Rand is moving against Samael. It's something he's been planning in a much more organized sense than any of the Forsaken he has had a showdown with yet. He is trying to actually wage war with one of the Forsaken. And of course, we then have the introduction of Mazrum Taim, who approaches Rand under the amnesty Rand has put out for men who can channel and says essentially, look, I know you and I are not both the dragon, but could I get like a little bit of special treat? No, Rand kind of shuts that down and actually just relegates Mazrum Taim to working in the Black Tower and being their Omerlin equivalent. He is the one who will be training men who can channel. Foreshadowing here from Mazrum Taim is quite spectacular. I can't get into it for spoilers, but wow. And in hindsight, we actually know what Robert Jordan had planned. Anyway, moving on. I also really liked having the infighting within Rand Rand's ranks where Davran Bashir hates Mazarum Taim and Rand essentially has to act as a parent in this situation. It shows such evolution and growth from the once farm boy. He is now ordering around some of the most powerful people in the world as if he is a parent and they are children. It's just our little sheep herders come a long way. From there though, we have a scene a bit later on where Rand is actually able to reunite with a bunch of the women from his hometown because they are being taken by Aes Sedai, Alana included, uh, to the White Tower to learn how to channel. And Rand has one of the most earned but different beats for him as a character where Alana bonds him without his consent. And this is very much so in my mind, a horrific act, you are without someone's permission mentally linking yourself to them forever, allowing you to see into their mind in a way that they do not want you to. That is vile. And it is very much so treated that way. Uh, Alana is doing something that is just not okay on a personal level, on a grand scope of things in the world level, it is somewhat understandable. I've always kind of been revolted by this act here. It's genuinely upsetting. And Rand has a 
quite violent reaction to this and leaves the inn after having a conversation with the girls from the Two Rivers who are finding out he's the Dragon Reborn and then heads to the Black Tower. And this just does a really good job of showing how disconnected Rand is from so much despite being at the center of everything. He doesn't have that same connection to his home. I mean, the people from where he grew up are kind of revolted by him. He cannot trust even the Aes Sedai he has met before because they're going to do stuff like this to him. Being the dragon consumes and eclipses being Rand. People do not treat him like the man he is, and instead they act like he is the destined savior that he is. And as I've grown up rereading these books, I just feel worse and worse for Rand. The isolation that is put on him is truly staggering. We also have Rand going back to the Black Tower after some time has gone on to see how Mazrum Time is doing. Yannisky agrees to allow Mazrum Team to go out and recruit more men who can channel to eventually try and rival the White Tower. Mazrum Taim is aggressively teaching these men how to use the One Power as a weapon. That is very much so a stark contrast to the White Tower, where you see in the training sequences we've seen in the series up to this point, a very well-rounded approach to utilization of the One Power in all kinds of different ways. Whereas in the Black Tower, we really only see it ever be trained as a weapon, because these people, quite actually understandably, are just preparing for the last battle, really. They are just learning how to be as effective on a battlefield as possible. That does not mean on an individual level there are not male channelers here that aren't learning other sides of things, and we'll see that later on, but in terms of just like the mass display of power we're seeing, it seems to be overwhelming towards violence, which of course is paid off magnificently at the end of this book. As we continue through Rand's plot line, though, we see a lot of the political maneuvering around him, his struggles in Camelin, and specifically actually some discovering of his heritage where he is related to Tigrain and also a brother to Galad, which he takes in stride quite well. There's that weird like beat where he's like, am I related to Ele no. Okay, cool. I'm not that weird. <laughs> and there's even politically a truce offered from Semiel who was saying, look, if you don't attack me before the last battle, I won't attack you. Do you? And of course, Rand is like, no. He knows that the last battle, the less Forsaken still standing, the better. So he's going to move to try and knock them down. Like it's a target practice and one of those carnival things where you just shoot the BBs. And the Forsaken seem almost like there's been a power shift dynamic where Rand is accomplished enough where they're no longer going like, look at this dumb far boy we can toy with. And instead there's like this, he, Robin's dick? Oh, shit. <laughs> we also have the introduction of Rand's school at this time, which is very neat. He tries to figure out how to break the water bond. You can't. Sorry, bud. And then as he goes back to Camelin, he is told of some Ogier that have come to try and find Loyal. He meets with them. Of course, we are introduced to Loyal's suitor, this woman. But he tells them, look, uh, Loyal's actually safe in the two rivers. They say, oh, well, then can we be taken there? And Rand strikes a deal where he says, first, I need you to help me find a bunch of these portals into the ways so I can destroy as many of them as possible because the shadow is using them. They agree. One of them is in Shadar Logoth, where Rand obviously can make a gateway too. So he goes there, leaves a trap on the gateway that is quite vicious and loses a maiden of the spear. And in one of the moments that really just feels like Rand being kicked while he's already quite low, he spends hours trying to find this maiden of the spear. Sun goes down, his voice is hoarse and it's just bothering him so much. Rand, despite being all these things and having all this pressure on him, it's a great little reminder for the reader that he is still just a farm boy who is revolted at the idea of someone being lost while just trying to protect him. Can't handle that. He's not like one of these nobles who can leave their bodyguards behind to just fight and die while they escape. This is going to haunt him forever. After they give up this search though, Rand takes the Ogier to the two rivers and drops them there, not knowing that Loyal's already gone. It's truly a, a heartbreaking moment to me where Rand has this beat of, that's my home. Bye. I don't know. There's something in the way Jordan's prose portray this scene that felt so sorrowful. Book six is truly the evolution of Rand. All the changes have happened and it's just a realization of exactly what he's become. Let's talk about Matt though for a minute because Matt during all of this has decided to move his army towards a lot of Rand's greater plans. He picks up Oliver, who I'm not gonna talk about much because I do not like him as a character. And he even discovers some tinkers who have been slaughtered. During the night, Matt is actually attacked by some Aiel who are apparently working for a Forsaken. And there's just 
this constant feeling of danger. There's a paranoia I have the more and more I read through the books with him, even on rereads where I know it's gonna happen, where he just always feels in danger, kind of because he's fairly reckless. I mean, he moves about with just kind of no real care, not a ton of bodyguards, despite having one of the biggest targets on in the world on his back. But his luck obviously carries him a lot of the time. It doesn't at certain points, but I don't know. Matt, to me, is one of the most successful characters in just a constant undertone of suspense suspense, especially with what is going to start chasing him before too, too long. We also have Egwene who has recovered from her fight with Lanfear and is moving about Karian. I do struggle to keep all the locations straight in my mind here. And in Karian, uh, she spots the White Tower emissary and Gawain, she learns of his love for her, all that stuff. And she goes to speak with the wise ones about this as a threat. Gawain treats it as a threat and she is right. We also see in one of my favorite character choices ever in the series, Berylaine gets along with the wise ones brilliantly. They respect the crap out of her. And that's because Berylaine is brilliant. And people who write off Berylaine clearly did not pay attention to the series that much much. Upon rereads, Berylaine just continues to climb up and up and up my favorite characters because she is someone who, yes, could be viewed as just like the super sexy noble woman. But once you actually look at her actions, especially background actions that just subtly come to flourish and if you're paying and reading between the lines a lot. She's a political genius. There's a first of a couple of meetings with the White Tower I die with Rand. It's just clearly set up for what's paid off later. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. And Egwene is then summoned to Saladar and she goes through the dream world to actually meet with these sisters. And she thinks she's gonna be put in trouble, have to be cast out from the White Tower and then go, or the rebel I die, and then go and meet with the wise ones to be welcomed in as the Aiel, which I like as a full realization of her uh, arc there her, with the Aiel. They actually really just accept her as one of their own. And in this read through, I just really appreciate that that's kind of where she's left with them, where like, no, you you are an Aiel as far as they're concerned. You did such an incredible job in your wise one training. We love you. Whatever happens, we got your back. It's just kind of beautiful. But she goes to Saladar and they actually are asking her to become their Omerlin, clearly as a puppet. They just want to use her as a figurehead and maybe even a scapegoat if things do not go their way. One of her first First acts as Omerlin is to raise Elaine and Nynaeve to full Aes Sedai and allow them to go off to find the Bull of the Winds, which is, you know, just duh. Like she's going to treat her, fr it's, it's a little bit like, not nepotism, but like clear bias towards your friends where it's like, uh, you guys are my homies. Your Aya Sedai. We know as the reader, they've earned it at this point. But it's like, I imagine from an outsider perspective, people who don't know Elaine and Nynaeve that much, you're kind of like, motherfucker. <laughs> Egwene quickly though is having trouble to be taken seriously as the Omerlin seat to the rebel Aya Sedai, where they are almost treating her like a puppet openly and it's kind of this power struggle and that's where I have one of my favorite Matt beats of the entire series as he arrives with Avienda to Saladar because of Rand's orders and he sees how Egwene is being treated after a great comedic moment where he's like wow whoever these people made the Omelin's a f***ing idiot anyway I'm gonna get y'all out of here don't worry Egwene you're the Omerlin for these people okay that's all right, but then he sees she's being disrespected and he just does this grandiose gesture of showing almost fealty and respect for her, which sends a message to the rest of the Aes Sedai that this is your Omerlin and the world will view her as such. Matt is far smarter, far more intuitive, and far better a friend than most readers give him credit for. I know early on he has some real dick moves towards other people in the group, but once he is matured and kind of comes into his own, Matt is the MVP bestie of the Wheel of Time. Matt is then utilized by the Rebel Aes Sedai to go with Elaine and Nynaeve to Ebedar to find the Bull of the Winds with Avienda, who has a nice little moment of like polyamory with Elaine. Uh, and they are then on the way to Ebedar to try and find the Bull of the Winds that will pick up really next book a lot more. So in the final beats here before the climax of the book, we see Gwen lets Loghain go, realizing that it is wrong for the Aes Sedai to continue to just keep men who can channel prisoners, especially because Loghain admits he's not the dragon anymore. And we have men arrive actually in the city with Rand and goes to see him. And they have a reunification and it's very clear men is head over heels in love with Rand. Perrin also arrives here roughly around the same time and Rand catches him up on world events, congratulates him on his marriage and Perrin gets to meet his new parents it's just Davrim Bashir, Fahil's dad, uh, and gets along with him quite well, which I like. I like that Davrim Bashir's like, you're pretty cool and impressive. I like that you married my daughter. Let's be friends. <laughs> it was like, oh, I expect it to go the other way, but I really like that outcome, especially because I really like Davrim Bashir as a character. From here though, ironically enough, Rand finds out that
out there is 13 Aes Sedai in the city with him, which he is freaked out by, and he runs to the other city where the White Tower embassy is. Turns out they snuck in 13 Aes Sedai, and while Rand is with men, they shield and capture him and put him in the box. This is one of the most intense uh, sequences for Rand in this point. He is being psychologically and physically tortured in a way that is truly horrific. He is put in a box by the Aes Sedai, beaten and confined relentlessly. And the only times he's allowed outside of the box is for basically just keeping him alive and beatings. Min is also treated very harshly at this point. Really establishing the morality of the true White Tower embassy is not quite on point. Once his friends discover he is missing, though, immediate action is taken. And this is where I think a lot of the other characters outside of Rand are really allowed to show how much they have grown in their authority, Perrin especially, as he organizes Rand's rescue. There is the whole barrel lane trying to seduce him thing, but we'll talk about that in the next book a lot more. And now the rescue of Perrin is a, just a full-on go. A mixture of Aiel, Two Riversmen, barrel lane's troops, and several others are now in hot pursuit of the Tower Emissary. And I like seeing how much their party kind of grows as they pursue the Tower Emissary. Not only do they come across the Saladar Aes Sedai who joined them, but Perrin tells the wolves, like, the dragon's been taken, and the wolves, the actual, like, nature side of things are like, uh-uh, we gonna go get him. <laughs> it just shows, like, the weight of what Rand is, that even animals, when they hear of his taking, are like, we will f murder everyone. We do get the tidbit from Rand's perspective, though, that after he found out Min was taken, he killed two warders with his bare hands, which, wow. And that was just in protection of Min, which shows his passionate care for her as well. But let's go ahead and fast forward to what we all want to talk about here, which is the, <laughs> the battle that commences. This battle is huge. Not only are there many channelers within the Tower Aes Sedai, but they have made a deal with the evil Aiel to protect them and act as a con Envoy, though they are betrayed, and now there are three sides to the fight. There are the massive amount of Shido Aiel trying to steal Rand from the Tower Aes Sedai, just as the Perrin army arrives and is like, let's save, what is happening? Oh, okay. Hey, they're already fighting, so. Let's just hit him from the back real hard. And we also get our first instance of watching Loyal in heavy combat, which, that's great. And they all continue to fight their way towards the center. Dumai's Wells is one of my favorite orchestrated battles from Robert Jordan because it has so many clear layers to it while being rather simple to watch as a viewer. There is the center caravan that is protected by a shield with a lot of Aes Sedai trying to keep the invading Aiel out. There is the Aiel surrounding them in a massive army. And there's Perrin's people flooding over top, which is more of an amalgamation type army. And it's truly tremendous already. And Rand on his own, in the inside does manage to break out from his shield and the box due to the Aes Sedai being called away from shielding him to try and maintain their own perimeter. And at this point, Rand explodes the chest out and thinks he might have accidentally killed men with debris from the chest. He did not. He gets her. And then things escalate immensely because Mazarum Taim arrives with his male channelers that are going to directly attack Aes Sedai and Aiel. And the most maybe infamous words from any action sequence and then the Wheel of Time are uttered. Ashaman kill. And here we see why the three oaths are so important, because with no regard for life, the Ashaman unleash a wave of death towards everyone who stands against them that is absolutely horrific. Watching this scene on the screen should be vile because it is described as a mixture of explosions and blending. Human bodies are just consumed by a wave of power. It is so awful that Rand orders it to stop and the Aiel run away. Aiel do not run, but they do from Ashaman. And Rand has made this weapon. It is of his doing and it is brutal. And then in the conclusion of the book, Rand is put back in his position of power with all of his allies around him. And he makes the Aes Sedai who captured him and those who rescued him kneel and swear fealty to him or else. It's a powerful scene. Uh, it truly shows how the once seen as most powerful institution in the world, the White Tower, now bends the knee to the Dragon Reborn. Not completely, this is just on an individual level, 
but still. I will say on the grand scale of the Wheel of Time series, this is the second most just everything is now changed moment of the series so far. And it is such a wonderful growth for Rand and Perrin. I don't want to also forget how much he has clearly changed as a leader as well. He organized and executed a rescue of Rand really on the turn of a dime and it was extremely successful. And it's because he is someone who people trust and can handle situations like this well, though he does doubt himself frequently. I do want to say I want to give Lord of Chaos an 8.5 out of 10. It is certainly one of the strongest Wheel of Time books and deserves almost all of the praise it gets. And I also forgot to mention that Gawain does have a confrontation with Rand where he essentially says like, I will get vengeance for what you did to my mother. But Rand's like, that won't be bro. And that drama will continue later on. But that is the ending of Lord of Chaos. I very much so understand why it's so many people's favorites. It's dropped out a bit for me because I think a lot of the enjoyment it does come from that last third. The beginning two thirds do suffer from some of Robert Jordan's biggest flaws as an author, but boy does it make up for that in that last bit. Anyway though, let me know what you think of Lord of Chaos in the comments down below. Like and subscribe if you have not already and tune in next month for the Wheel of Time read along continued. Yes, I will be doing these once a month. I can only space them out so much. If you cannot read a whole Wheel of Time book in a month, that's on you. <laughs> Bye.